we're just going to pick up where we left off um, last time. So we talked about phonics um, last time and phonics instruction, what that looks like, and um, related that to the alphabetic principle. Um, so basically, um, when we're getting into phonics and decoding, so successful readers can break the code between the letters and sounds of a word and can attach the meaning of the word. So that's kind of what decoding is. So it's a, it's a very critical skill um, and it attributes a lot to a child's ability to read fluently and comprehend. Um, so the child has to know, like Juliet was saying, the letter and the sound that that letter makes and able to decode words. Um, so just some definitions for you to know. So uh, decodable words are words containing phonic elements that were previously taught. And then decoding is the ability to translate a word from print to speech. Um, so that's done by employing knowledge of sound symbol correspondences like we just talked about. Um, and then it's also the act of deciphering a new word by sounding it out. So um, I'm sure you've heard or even practiced that um, when someone tells you to sound out a word that is a decoding skill. So when someone is decoding a word, they are actively putting effort into figuring out how to say that word. Um, it's not automatic. They can't read it with automaticity, like no effort. Like when they're decoding it, they're putting in some type of effort to sound out the word or chunk the word, divide it up into parts that they do know. Um, and then for containing phonemic, phonic elements that were previously taught, the reason this works for young emerging readers is because in a word like cat, for example, phonic elements that were previously taught can literally be the letter C and the sound K to go along with it, and then at the sounds that go with those letters. So the phonic elements can literally be those, the sounds that match the letters. And so then touching back on phonics again, I just included the definitions because um, it is pretty broad and it's one of the more complex um, concepts on the fort. So phonics has several definitions. Um, it's an instructional strategy that teaches about the relationship between letters and their sounds. And it can also be considered the study of the relationship between letters and the sounds that they represent. Um, and then it's also used to describe reading instruction that teaches sound symbol correspondences. So um, it's very broad and it contains a lot of things that you'll find on the fort itself. Um, so if you're ever feeling confused about any of the stuff we're talking about when discussing phonics, um, having the definition handy and referring back to that and making it make sense within the context of what we're talking about will be really helpful. Um, so again, um, just some more review. So there's a specific relationship between sounds and letters, um, and that relates to the alphabetic principle as well, which is another concept we touched on. Um, so an example is like students may learn to make the sound s for S and then they apply that to every word part that has an S in it. Um, so if they see the word sock, they know it makes the S sound where it's S or um, cast, they know it has a S in the middle of the word, et cetera. So, so then, that, oh, go ahead. <laughs> so that type of instruction um, is just overall promoting students to match the sounds with the letters that they're coming across in right next to each other in words in books that they attempt to read so young learners basically are connecting letters to sounds um so then there are like two main types of teaching phonics um does anybody know what they are or can anybody tell me what they are you can unmute yourself and just say them if you know them is it explicit and implicit yeah, so yeah, there's two main types to teaching phonics and those are explicit and implicit. So explicit is teaching um, individual part to whole and implicit is teaching um, from whole to part. Um, and if you don't remember us talking about those, we did post the last video so you can go and rewatch that part. Um, and then phonics instruction. So that, um, sorry, I got distracted by the chat. <laughs> okay, so phonics instruction is relevant to all young readers um, as they learn how to connect the letters to the sounds. Um, so uh, that small part says teaching reading and spelling in a way that stresses the connection between letters and the sounds they represent, teaches the dissection of words into parts, and then blending the sounds together again. Phonics can be taught directly or can be incorporated in ongoing reading and writing. Um, so, like I said before, 
phonics is a huge overall um, very broad topic and then the instruction zooms in on you know studying or teaching the relationship between the letters and the sounds to help teach reading skills um, etc so then another definition down there is phonogram so a phonogram is a succession of letters that represent the same phonological unit in different words so for example there I, G, H in flight, might, tight, sigh, and high. So all, when those three letters come together, they're making that same sound. So that's a component of phonics instruction because it's like letters matching with sounds, but it's a consistent pattern. It's a consistent word part that when a student sees it, they would know they could chunk a word to figure it out. So decoding is that ability to use those that understanding of the letters to sound to sound out words so in the visual there they could do it in a couple different ways they could look at the letters from left to right they could say each of them they could use context clues they could think about what if the word makes sense if the spelling makes sense if it's close to the words around it or if it's close to another word that they know so then a related question um, so you can just think about this one. So phonemic awareness contributes most to the development of phonic skills in beginning readers by helping them, A, recognize ways in which one sound can be represented in print, B, count the number of syllables in a written word, C, identify in spoken language separate sounds that can be mapped into letters, or D, understand the concept of a silent letter. So send to the chat what you think is a possible answer or the best answer. All right, we have a couple of responses of C, and that is a great choice there. So recognizing ways in which sound can be represented in print. So that for A, that's a, that's a good option, but we do have a better one there. So count the number of syllables in a written word. So being able to count the syllables first, they need to be able to say it. And when students are learning phonics and they're still learning those letter connections, they're probably not able to say a word and then break it apart. So for C, identifying spoken language separate sounds that can be mapped into letters. That's the one that really connects to, okay, we're talking about sounds and letters. So with phonics or with phonemic awareness of, hey, what does the sound, what does the word van start with? It starts with v. Telling a student that that starts with a V is a very sequential way to help a beginning reader. And then understand the concept of a silent letter. That's not going to be in every word, but so that's where C comes in as the best option. So phonemic awareness would not relate directly to that like letter skill because we just have the sound. So matching that sound to the letters in C was a better option. So D describes, yeah, D does not describe that. So that just, those just go over the answers. We include those, so like if people refer back to the PowerPoint, they can go step by step where um, we typically have discussion over um, our group sessions, obviously, but that's a little challenging on here. Um, so another related question, which of the following strategies would be most effective in promoting second graders decoding of multisyllabic words? Um, so I won't read the answers to you because that can kind of be distracting, so I'll let you go ahead and read those and then you can go ahead and do the same thing. Um, just send an answer in the chat when you have an idea of what you think might be the correct answer. And then once everybody responds, um, we'll move on to some discussion. So to further frame this question, we're talking about second graders and multisyllabic words. So that's a little bit more complex of a task. So a second grader, we know that they can read single syllable words. So they are now beginning to work with bigger words. 
So then going through the answers, it looks like everybody said C. Um, so why can we rule out A? So does anybody, if you want to unmute yourself and just give an idea why we could rule out A right away? Anybody? <laughs> Um, I'll say something. So repeated exposure to predictable text is not developing decoding because when they're looking at predictable text and they're looking at the same text, they might more so be memorizing, but decoding is a skill that we want them to be able to apply to any type of word, not just the same text over and over because over time they'll remember it and they'll memorize it. So E does not sound like a great option there. Yeah. Yeah, so A is incorrect because reading predictable text is used with like beginning readers. Um, it's not appropriate for teaching the specific skill of decoding those multi-syllable words. Um, so then what about B? Does anybody know why we could rule out B right away? It makes me think of if the students are sounding out individually, they're going to lose comprehension and they won't even know what the word says or figure out how to um, say multiple syllable words or read multiple syllable words. Yep, yeah, that's, that's a really that's, good idea. Yeah. Sorry, Julia, you can go. Oh, ahead. you're good. That's definitely a very tedious task. And by the time they're working on multi syllable words, the fact that they can already say single syllable words makes us believe that they are not still sounding out every word phoneme by phoneme because like you said that would take a long time and the longer you take to decode a word the less comprehension you have yeah and that's exactly how the book breaks it down too so sounding out words letter by letter is a strategy that beginning readers can use for use for those very simple words um and like the one-to-one -one letter sound correspondences but it's not efficient overall so um, yeah, it slows them down a little bit and it's not an uh, ideal strategy for decoding like complex words, um, typical for like second grade readers. Um, so then moving on, so why can we, oops, well I just showed you, so why can we rule out D? Um, <laughs> Sorry guys, so uh, D is incorrect because practicing with flashcards is not appropriate until students have learned how to process all the letters. Um, so, and when you think about it in context, context of the question, um, really using drills and flashcards, we talked about this at the beginning too in the very first session, using drills and flashcards is not a best practice. Um, it is, you know, for studying for the fort, but more than likely anything on the fort that asks for drills and flashcards will not be the answer just because of that. Um, it's not a best practice. You shouldn't rely on your students um, to know something or to know how to decode using drills and flashcards. So that makes the answer C. So, excuse me, by second grade, um, students have typically learned to read a wide variety of syllable patterns in single syllable words. Since most of the syllables in multi-syllable words follow the same patterns as those in single syllable words, the primary challenge is for students to learn to decode my, or, Learning to decode multi-syllable words is um, learning to recognize the words as a series of discrete syllables. So this recognition allows the students to apply their prior knowledge of syllable pattern um, to, deco bleh, to decoding longer words. So the strategy used in C, which is encouraging those students to compare the parts of new multi-syllable words with known single syllable words is effective because it focuses the students' attention on like recognizing the component syllables in said words. So a good example of that is like yesterday. So if a student doesn't know how to say all of that, they can chunk it apart and they can say yes. So they can say day. And then all that they're putting time and attention into decoding is ter. Then they have yes, ter, day. So for a general takeaway, like she said, think about what best practices are um, as you're answering questions. There are certain options that are like guess or memorize or use drills and flashcards. Um, so just think to yourself what you would feel most, what you feel is a best practice. And if those are options, those typically are not best practices. And a majority of questions as we can see are scenarios. So you'll be transforming vocab knowledge. Um, so drills and flashcards, yeah, just typically are not best practice. So, um, 
sorry, go ahead. <laughs> You're good. Okay, so another concept that we just saw that is quick to breeze over, but there is a couple, there's there are a couple questions on the Ford on it is what a compound word is. So two words come together to make a new word with a new meaning. That's a compound word. Um right, an example, or you can remember an example of it. Um snowman's a good easy one you can think about for kids. Um, so then a related question to that is on the next. So a teacher, a second grade teacher asked students to put two single syllable nouns to form a new word, bulb and light, and asked them to form a new word by putting them together, light bulb. Students then draw pictures to illustrate their new words and write short stories using the new words. This activity is likely to be most effective for helping students. A, use visuals as a reading comprehension strategy. B, apply knowledge of phonics generalizations. C, use context clues to identify from unfamiliar words. D, understand the concept of compound words. So she's having them take two words, put them together, and then make a drawing to deepen their understanding or comprehension of the new word. So right away we can rule out C because we're only working with one word. Um, so there are no context clues. Context clues are like more surround, other clues, surround, other words surrounding text in like sentences and longer writing. So that's where we can rule out C. Apply knowledge of phonics generalizations. So all we know is that they're using single syllable nouns. We know nothing about what kind of blends they're using, what kind of digraphs there might be with vowels. So phonics generalizations, we don't know anything about the words that she's actually using. We only know this one example. So we don't, know, we don't know for sure that there are phonics generalizations, so we can rule out B. A, use visualizations that are, as a reading comprehension strategy. So the pictures that they're drawing will definitely help them understand the word, but the word they're trying to understand is a compound word. So that makes D the best answer. Thank you for sending those to the chat. I just didn't want to like breeze over that. So that's what a compound word is. Um, these are just the explanations as to why the other ones are incorrect. Should we just touch base on? Um, so then just to go over um, more related concepts. So consonants and vowels, we should be all pretty familiar with. Um, so the vowels are A, E, I, O, U, um, and consonants are everything in between. Um, so we kind of talked about this in one of the previous um, sessions, like I said again. Um, but some useful generalizations about consonants and vowels. So consonants um, are fairly reliable. There's a strong relationship between the letter and the sound that we expect to represent that letter. Um, and then consonants represent the dominant sounds in words. Um, so when you hear a word, you're hearing the consonant stress. Taylor, did you have a question? You've been on yourself. No, I'm good. I just lost connection for... Oh no. Okay, hopefully that gets fixed. Okay, um, I'm just gonna go ahead and move on. Um, so there are some irregular, uh, irregularities um, though. So a letter can represent more than one phoneme. So for example, some consonants um, can, um, sorry, can produce a hard or a soft sound. So the hard C would be in the sound of cat. So it makes the K sound and then a soft c would be in the uh, word scent so it starts with the same letter but it's making the s sound um, and then another example is the hard g in game versus um, in gym or gentle you're hearing the j versus the g so those are some consonant irregularities so and then in a consonant blend we know that each consonant is still heard we outwardly say both of them the word blend itself i have underlined the blend so you say it through the through to the end. So those letters don't come together to make a new sound. You say B and L as if they weren't next to each other. You say both of them, B, L, blend. So then comparing that to a consonant digraph. So a consonant digraph is a blend of two letters that come together to make one sound. So um, an example of this would be even in the word digraph, you're, the P and the H, so the P and the H are coming together to make a sound. So um, that's two different consonants that are coming together to make a totally different sound. So you're not hearing the um, names of each of the letters where in a blend you would. So in the blend you're hearing the b, l, bl versus um, the p, h is f. So 
um, that's the difference between those two. So they kind of contrast each other, which is nice. Um, and a blend has a blend and a digraph has a digraph. So that's a good strategy to remember that. Um, so then just for review, you can go ahead and write down to yourself, if you have not already, what a consonant blend is. If you wanna be extra cool, you can go ahead and write what a consonant digraph is. So yeah, Julia did a good job. So she's just putting an example in the chat if you wanna do that. We can do that. Um, we'll move forward still. So another related question. So my family went to the circus last weekend. I like the clowns the best. They were very funny. A student makes several miscues when reading this sentence out loud. Which of the following miscues represents an error in decoding consonant blends? So notice the question is focusing strictly on decoding consonant blends. So they're omitting circus, so they're getting rid of the word circus. They're pronouncing clowns as clones. They're saying bet for best, or they're shortening funny to fun. You can go ahead and put your answer in the chat. Everybody did that one pretty quick. Here. So, although clowns does have that consonant blend in there of the W and the N, the change that they make is with the vowel. So, their spelling with the E S makes it sound, um, their spelling with the vowel there makes us believe that they did hear both sounds, clones, um, or clones, how, how you would actually say it. But their spelling tries to um, emphasize each sound in the word. Um, they just kind of mispronou mispronounce that O-W part of it, which where we outwardly hear that with a vowel at the beginning, that O-W would become a vowel diphthong. Um, so it's a little confusing there, but that O-W is like an kind of like O-W now like where you outwardly say both of those sounds, when it's a vowel and then a sound where you outwardly hear both of them, like O-Y to joy, you outwardly hear both of them, versus for C, which um, others answered, they're omitting that S-T, which is that consonant blend. The error here in B was closer to the vowel. So C. So like Juliet was saying, so B represents an error in decoding a diphthong. Um, so to review what a diphthong is, so a diphthong is um, pretty much what she just explained with those vowels. If you want to touch on that more, Juliet, I don't know. Yeah, so it's kind of very interesting how W is one of the examples that they use um, for diphthongs where you're saying both of them, but a diphthong is where you outwardly hear both of those sound, like your, your mouth rolls through each sound um, is the way that they explain it, versus a vowel digraph is similar to a consonant digraph where you don't outwardly say each sound. Um, and I'm pulling something else up here. So in a digraph, when two vowels go walking, the first one does the talking and says its name um, versus in a diphthong, it's a blend of vowel sounds where each sound is still heard. So you can think about the O-W in cow. So in this example, it was clowns or the O-Y in toy are Jennifer Yeager's examples. Um, so this error is actually a diphthong error because it related to how they how they expressed that vowel, the ow, um, versus st is two consonants, and that was, um, they completely omitted that. So that one is a little bit more specific to a blend. Yeah. Um, but this is a prime example of how they are tricky. <laughs> Yeah, so a good a good way to practice that too. I know as I was reading the question, I read best, so I knew that the st was a blend because I could hear both of the sounds. Um, wearing clowns, um, once you have that knowledge of, or once you I guess are more familiar with the vocabulary of diphthong versus digraph, um, vowels and consonants, you'll notice that the own 
in um, clowns is um, a vowel diphthong. So um, moving on. So A is a whole word omission. So um, they got rid of the word as a whole in the sentence. And then D is an omission of an entire syllable. Um, so they read funny as fun. So they're getting rid of a whole part of the word, um, which doesn't really have anything to do with blending. Um, so C, so saying bet for best is the answer. So a constant blend is a sequence of two or more consonants in a word, each of which represents a separate phoneme. So we hear both the S and the T. So that would be the best answer because that one is the only one that contains a blend. Um, so we already talked about constant digraphs. So um, this was kind of out of order. That's our fault. <laughs> um, but again, it's the f and phone or the sh sound. It's two consonants that come together to make a new sound. So digraph makes me laugh is a good strategy to remember that because there are two digraphs in there, the f and the gh making the, the laugh sound. So then more varied than consonants, we have vowels, which can either be long or short. So here are just some examples that young learners interact with. Long and short, and don't be afraid to say words out loud to yourself when you're taking the test. Don't be afraid also to clap syllables to yourself. Um, I mean, if you need to say something out loud to figure out if it's a long or short vowel where you emphasize something more, feel like definitely do so. Just don't do it too loud. <laughs> Yeah, so a long vowel, uh, we like to say, says its name. So in grape, you're hearing the A, or in apple, you're hearing the A ah sound. Um, so long vowels say the name of the letter. Um, so then remember, just for young students, um, as a general idea, that vowels are more difficult to learn because each letter is represented by more than one distinct sound. Um, the sound depends on all of the surrounding letters, so any letter around it is what the vowel sound will depend on. Um, they're also harder to discriminate, so they're harder to hear, obviously manipulate and identify which sound is which. And then digraphs, when two vowels go walking, the first one does talking and says its name. So you can think digraph, just like a consonant digraph, where they're coming together to make a new sound. So you can have some of these letter combinations be both digraphs and diphthongs where you hear both of them. So like in peach, I'm hearing E and a, uh, so that would be a dip, uh, a <laughs> diphthong. But if I have the word read R and D surrounding E a, I'm only hearing that E sound. So digraph, you can think just like consonant digraph, you outwardly say, a new sound. So in week or book, took, look, um, you're coming together to make, you're not outwardly saying both E's. Um, and on the next side, if we have vowel diphthongs, we can think of diphthongs as the equivalent of consonants. Like a consonant is to a blend as a vowel is to a diphthong, where we can outwardly feel our mouths saying both sounds. On here, we have that OW combination again, like we saw with clowns. We have brown, where we're outwardly saying both of them in um, noise. We outwardly hear the O and the I. So vowel diphthong, we outwardly hear and can feel our mouths if we really slow it down saying both letters. So then again, a diphthong. So it's a blend of all sounds where each sound is still heard. Um, so this is really important to remember. So the term blend is used for referring to consonants where a diphthong is the vowel equivalent to that. So um, you can always think consonant, blend, vowel, diphthong. That'll be really important for you to know um, when differing those two on the test. And then digraphs make you laugh. <laughs> Um, yeah, so digraphs, yeah, are the same in both cons. So there's consonant digraph and a vowel digraph. Um, they both do the same thing. So they make this sound. Uh, it's two letters coming together, two, uh, yeah, letters coming together to make one sound. Um, so that's the same. The only thing that's different would be the um, vowel diphthong versus consonant blend. Um, so we kind of talked about some diphthong examples. So Vowel diphthong oi, so coin, 
rejoice voice and point um if you say those out loud kind of like i just did um you can definitely feel you, you'll feel the difference and then same with oi boy toy destroy you're saying um or pay attention to your how your mouth moves with those Vowels can also be pronounced differently based on the fact that there could be an R behind them. So if you think about car versus care, or you think about cab, can, cat, you're making that a ah sound versus when there's an R, it becomes ah, ah, like car versus cat, cab, cat, cat, <laughs> cab, can versus R. Or so if you think about four, like the O-R in four, versus if you had bond or found, that O sound changes. The I-R in bird changes versus if it was like bind instead of bird. So take note of the fact that when there's an R behind a vowel, it changes the way that the vowel is pronounced. So that is another one of the patterns, R controlled. And then we also have um, consonant, vowel, consonant, E words, which is when, when there's an E at the end and the vowel becomes long. So with cat, cab, cam versus came, can versus cane, you say them differently. The example here is cap versus cape or brave versus like brand. Um, you say it differently when there's an E at the end. We don't outwardly say the E. So the first vowel usually has that long sound and then the E becomes silent. So brave or cape kind of take on that A-Y sound um, and then they end with P. So we don't out really hear the E at the end. So if there's an R behind a vowel or an E at the end of a short word, it can change the way the vowel is said, which is why it's a component of teaching literacy because a student would say cappy instead of cape. So then um, moving on, we'll dive a lot deeper into this in further sessions, um, but just to kind of start to introduce you as we wrap up today. Um, so C and V, so a C stands for consonant and a V stands for vowel. Um, if you have the Jaeger guide or probably any text, um, you'll see all of the different patterns they, there could be. So there could be CVC words, there can be CVCV words. Um, so just know what the C and the V stand for. It's pretty self-explanatory, so hopefully you follow along. Um, but CVC words are the uh, words that are taught first to young students. So those are words such as car, cat, sit, top, mop, map, nap, um, just in general. Um, but I think that's where we'll end today, um, just because we'll get into a lot more advanced stuff after that, and I don't want to start it and not be able to finish that. Um, so are there any questions about the stuff that we covered today before we end the meeting, or by, anything in general? By the way, next time we'll be talking about um, decoding, comprehension, fluency, and automaticity. So what we have worked through so far under the 35% of the test, that's foundations of reading development. So that's understanding phonological and phonemic awareness, concepts of print and the alphabetic principle, phonics, and then word analysis, which we'll get into with decoding. So hopefully you guys feel pretty comfortable with where we are considering we're meeting next Monday and we will get through decoding and automaticity. And then we have 18, so that's 27% of the test. And then 18% of the test is assessment. And then our last session will be on the writing portion. So.